Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I want you to listen to part one. This is going to run over five days of my interview with Mustafa Suleiman, who has authored this book, The Coming Wave. Artificial intelligence is going to change everything. And Mustafa Suleiman is one of the half dozen of people that John Ellis of News Item says actually knows what they're talking about. Founder of DeepMind, co-founder of, um, of, what do we call it? Inflection AI. Uh, he's also the co-founder of DeepMind, not the founder. Let's listen to the first part of my interview, which I taped last night with Mustafa Suleiman. Joined now by Mustafa Suleiman. He is one of the people who John Ellis says is the half dozen or so who actually understand artificial intelligence and what we're facing. He's also the author of this brand new book, The Coming Wave. The Coming Wave is, um, uh, I have to say, it's sort of epic. Good morning uh, or afternoon, Mustafa. I'm not sure where you are. Where are you today? Good afternoon, Hugh. Great to be with you. I am in New York today, so it's a lovely sunny oh, afternoon. We are in the same time zone. Then I will let people know. We are taping this on Wednesday, September 6th at 5 in the afternoon. I'll play it on my radio show tomorrow and make the transcript available. Thank you for joining me. I did not plan, uh, it wasn't planned that you would come on to talk about the coming wave at the same time that Time Magazine has Elon Musk on the cover talking with Walter Isaacson about artificial intelligence. Did you have that plan that way for the rollout of the book? That was not planned, but you know, the timing is going to work out just fine, I think. It's pretty funny to see yeah, this the, come out. Very interesting. This, the synergy is very good. Now, when John Ellis, and I don't know if you know John, but he's a newsman's newsman, when he says a half dozen to eight people understand AI and he lists you in that, is that hyperbole or is that an accurate statement? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there are lots of people who understand AI very deeply. I mean, the field is is huge now. Um, and, you know, there are many, many people who've been working on it for some time, actually. I'm among the group who has been working on AI, you know, in the earlier stages in this new wave. So, you know, I started DeepMind along with two friends in 2010. And, you know, it's, I guess it's almost been sort of 13 years or so at this point um, working in the field. Uh, but there are many luminaries above and beyond me, you know, many professors who have been in the field for 30 years or so toiling away. So I, I'm really part of the new generation. When he says that, I think he means, and when I read the Time Magazine article, I saw the names of Hasabis, Elon, Larry Page, Sam Altman, Siobhan Zalas, uh, you. Right. And I'm curious, could we put you all in a conference room somewhere and come up with a regulatory scheme after a few days? <laughs> well, the funny thing is that the anecdote in that Time magazine piece described a time when we actually did try to do that. So myself, yes, Elon Musk, Demis, my co-founder at the time, uh, Eric Schmidt, Reid Hoffman, um, you know, the list goes on, a bunch of other people. We got together at SpaceX in uh, 2015 uh, and that was one of the first times where we had convened to try and figure out like what the future of safe AI might look like. How do we sort of regulate this? And, you know, the uh, various combinations of that group have been meeting, you know, for a pretty long time. And, you know, we've been doing our best to try and figure it out. Now, you're talking with someone who's been a regulator since 1983 in one form or another at the state, the local and the federal level. And my first lecture on leg regulatory policy was in 1974 by James Q. Wilson. So I brought a regulator and a lawyer's eye to this. And I don't think it's nice. possible, Mustafa. I really don't think it's possible to contain the technology. But I want you to be able to explain to people why, if I am wrong, that is a bad situation. Could we start perhaps by having you uh, define both AI, AGI, and ACI? Because you went to great pains at the beginning of the coming wave to make sure people are understanding that one is a science, one is an endpoint, and one is where we are right now. So why don't you do the intro for the Pittsburgh Steeler fans who are listening? <laughs> That's a great description. So artificial intelligence as a field is the science and engineering of teaching machines to learn because learning is what makes us unique as a species, right? We can pick up new skills, we can learn new languages, Crucially, we can use tools, right? No other species really uses tools in a developed way. And tools help us be smarter, more efficient, more productive. You know, they are really the engine of progress. 
And so if anything, you can think of the quest to build AIs as a quest to help create more tools in the world that help us grow better crops, you know, travel more efficiently, use energy more efficiently, have better healthcare. That's really what we're driving at here. The narrower forms of AI, um, which we're working on these days, are where you apply a machine learning tool in a product, so a piece of software that maybe recognizes faces in your photographs, or it maybe you know dictates your speech so that when you when you can speak into your telephone, it'll transcribe you know your text messages. Those kinds of things are what we have today. Where we're going in the future are artificial capable intelligences. So they can't just record and translate information but they can actually take actions on your behalf. They can do useful things for you. They, so that, that might include things like booking an appointment, you know, to go to the doctor, right? Like automatically on your behalf, you know, maybe in the future, they'll be able to organize your vacation, right? Maybe they'll be able to buy your groceries. Those are the kinds of capabilities that we expect to emerge over the next five years as these AIs get better and better. The third type of AGI... <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that all sounds benign. That sounds like a wonderful right. thing, but it's not necessarily a wonderful thing. And that takes us to everything between ACI and AGI or ACI where we are today and ACI just prior to AGI. What is it that worries you so that comes through on almost every page on the coming wave? Yeah, you're exactly right. So the third phase of that beyond ACI, where you're just getting AIs to do useful, practical things for you, is an, a an AI that gets out of the box, right? It self-improves over time. It can develop its own goals. And, you know, it may be very difficult to contain that and prevent it from spreading far and wide and doing damage. Now, I think we're a long way away from anything like that. And a lot of people have speculated about a point at which, you know, an AGI might just recursively self-improve. So just constantly get better and better through updating its own programming. And that could be a dangerous event. But I, I mean, I think it's a very theoretical, very speculative idea. And I think it's decades away. And a lot of the conversation has been focused on that, unfortunately, this Terminator or Skynet framing of AI, which I think is pretty unhelpful and is pretty far off right now. It is. But what I did, I think, I especially appreciate about the coming way from a non-scientist lawyer perspective is that you put it in the context of the general scientific revolution of the last 200 years. And the example that stands out is the telephone. Alexander Graham Bell invents a telephone in 1876. By 1900, there are 600,000 of them. By 1910, there are 6.8 million of them. That's a glimpse of the rapid, almost um, impossible to stop proliferation of technology. And I don't know how many phones we have today, and they're nothing like Mr. Uh, Bell used to say, hey, come here. So what this inexorable march of technology is one theme of the coming wave. So we're going to get to AGI at some point. Is that at some point? I'm not going to ask you for a time. But do you agree we will get to that point of machines learning on their own, independent of human instruction and oversight? Yes, I do think that if you think out far enough, like on a century time scale or maybe five or six decades, then, you know, that has been the trajectory of technology so far, right? If something is useful, then it tends to get cheaper and easier to use. It sounds obvious to say that but it is actually a law of technology. Everything, all of our general purpose technologies, steam, electricity, even language itself, you know, they're, they're sort of ideas that evolve as they get more and more useful and they adapt, right? Just like we don't use telephones so much anymore, we use smartphones because it's a more efficient way of communicating. And if that trajectory continues, then you essentially have smaller and smaller units of capability that can be transferred, moved around. You can now put a million images on a tiny thumbstick that used to take pallets and pallets, warehouses full of magazines to print, and then could only be drawn before that, you know, hundreds of years ago, where you had to paint an image to be able to communicate it. Now we can just send it in the, you know, instantly. 
So we, we've, we're on a multi-century transition from things being really big and slow and complex to move around to being really, really small and transmissible and being captured as ideas. And if that continues, then you're right. We end up in this scenario where power or the ability to get things done, the ability to transmit information and to take actions, that can actually be spread far and wide. And that's what I've really tried to address in my book, which is what is- That the- completes part one of my interview with Mustafa Suleiman. We talked for almost an hour. It'll be on Friday and Monday show, but that's the teaser. Stay tuned, I'm going to do it.